At its peak, Daewoo Group had been Korea's fourth largest business conglomerate, along with Hyundai, Samsung, and LG. The sprawling company rocketed upwards on the back of a favorable political environment and heaps of debt. Then, in a shocking two-year span, the whole group broke apart under the weight of its liabilities, a crushing recession, and a widespread fraud. Daewoo's collapse tarnished the legacy of founder and chairman Kim Woo Jung, who had to flee the country until he received a pardon. In this video, we will look at the rapid rise and startling collapse of Korea's Daewoo Group. But first, the Asianometry Patreon. Go check it out. Early access members get to see new videos and selected references for them before they are released to the public. It helps support the videos and I appreciate every pledge. Thanks, and on with the show. Born in 1936, Kim Woo Jung was the fourth of six children. His father served as the principal of Daegu Normal School, the primary school of future Korean President Park Chung-hee, and would eventually become the governor of Jeju Island. But after leaving his governor post, the elder Kim was abducted during the Korean War and never returned, leaving the family to fend for itself. After the Korean War, the younger Kim moved from his hometown of Daegu to Seoul, where he studied economics in Yongsei University, one of Korea's elite universities. He graduated in 1960 at the age of 25. After that, he worked at a textile trade and export company founded by one of his relatives. He worked there for six years. In 1967, Kim, just 30 years old at the time, founded a textile trading company of his own called Daewoo Industrial. It started out small, with just $18,000 and four employees, but the Chinese characters in Daewoo literally mean great universe, and it signified the founder's great ambitions. In 1970, through sheer persistence, Kim managed to convince American department stores like Sears, J.C. Penney, and Montgomery Ward to sell his textiles, but it would be fortunate scuttlebutt that helped cement his sales position there. His American customers told him that the U.S. government was planning on setting a quota on textile imports, Foreign suppliers would receive a percentage of that quota based on their current market share. Daewoo decided to sacrifice both profits and product quality to gain as much market share as possible before the quota was imposed. This ballsy gambit paid off, and in 1972, Daewoo was awarded 30% of the quota, instantly catapulting the fledgling company to their first bucket of gold. By its fourth year, Daewoo had exported textile goods worth over $4 million, becoming Korea's second largest exporter. This de facto monopoly would provide the cash flow to fund the company's future expansions. Throughout the 1960s, President Park Chung hees administration focused on building up exports and capacity in certain strategic industries. The companies who decided to follow their lead and succeed would receive favorable loans and funding. Daewoo was one of those companies. In 1973, a year after receiving its lucrative textile quota, Daewoo expands into a dizzying series of new industries like machinery, shipbuilding, construction, and automobiles. These expansions came through acquisitions and joint ventures. Daewoo excelled at turnarounds. They had relentless perseverance and an appetite for risk that would make Wall Street bets blush. For instance, in 1976, the company acquired a struggling industrial machinery manufacturer called Hankook Machinery. Kim renamed it to Daewoo Heavy Industries, and it turned a profit in its second year. In 1978, Daewoo acquired a struggling shipbuilding company called Okpo Shipbuilding, which was then merged into Daewoo Heavy Industries. The shipyard also turned around and made a profit five years later. Daewoo's playbook followed that of its textiles business a focus on market share over profits with high volume and low prices, without a strong focus on brand. They rarely thought about upgrading their technologies or moving upscale into more valuable segments or markets. Also in line with the government's preferences, Daewoo focused on exports. Kim traveled the world 260 days of the year, and Daewoo sold their goods mostly in emerging countries in Eastern Europe, Central Asia, Southeast Asia, and Africa. We cannot talk about Daewoo's extremely rapid rise to prominence without also talking about the company's relations with the government. 
Daewoo benefited from founder Kim's personal ties to Park Chung-hee. If you recall, Kim's father was the principal of Park's primary school. In addition, the company regularly hired government elites and retired state bankers for its executives. These close ties helped Daewoo secure absurdly favorable loans. In a time when annual inflation got as high as 40% and private banks charged interest rates way over that, Daewoo's loans were in the 6-9% range. It was a really good deal. But of course, these gifts and benefits had strings attached. In return for these preferential loans, monopoly protections, favorable labor laws, and silent backing, the Chebol followed guidance and contributed hundreds of millions of dollars to their president's slush funds. Nobody on the outside, of course, saw this. What they saw was a world-famous businessman who spun gold wherever he went. Chairman Kim, as he was called, became personally famous. He was profiled in international business magazines and elected chairman of the Federation of Korean Industries, first amongst equals. He wrote an autobiography in 1989 named Every Street is Paved with Gold. It naturally became a bestseller, selling over 2 million copies and was translated into 21 languages. The Daewoo Group's ownership structure started off like a normal conglomerate. Think of a holding company like Berkshire Hathaway, with subsidiaries underneath them like Geico, Berkshire Hathaway Energy, and Dairy Queen. At the start, Daewoo's core holding company was private, owned by the founder and his family. This was the case for many Korean chaebol. But in the 1970s, the Korean government demanded that the chaebol take their holding companies public. The reasons for doing so were twofold. First, it would help bring much-needed liquidity to the Korean stock markets, and second, it would help the rest of the country participate in the fruits of their economic efforts. The Chebul, Daewoo included, didn't want to do this. They got all the money they needed from the banks. But they finally caved after the government curbed certain shareholder rights to protect the family's control. To guarantee that control, the family set up the super complicated cross-ownership structure that Asian conglomerates are now famous for. The Chebul were now free to offer stock to the public slowly diluting their economic shares in the company while still maintaining total control. By 1997, Chairman Kim and his family owned, on average, just 6.1% of the shares in Daewoo Group companies. But with each Daewoo subsidiary owning some 30% of each other, Kim controlled an average of 38.3% of the votes. No shareholder or even group of shareholders could challenge him, even as his decision-making became increasingly erratic. Worse yet, the Chebol's ultra-complicated structure and interlocking dependencies, Daewoo companies only used each other's services, made it difficult to figure out who was making money and who was losing it. But no one worried too much about that, so long as the government was going to bail them out. Which they will, right? Entering 1979, Daewoo Group owned 41 companies and was South Korea's largest exporter. Remember, it had just been founded 12 years earlier. The late 1970s would mark two momentous events for Daewoo. First, it entered the car business. In 1978, Daewoo hooked up with GM Korea to acquire 50% of Sehan Motor, a company that dates back to the 1930s. In 1992, they'd acquire full control. Daewoo Motors applied the same playbook as it did with their other products low prices and low quality with little focus on R&D and technical upgrading. Competing in this business with its cutthroat pricing would strain the company's finances down the line. The second big event would be the assassination of Pak Tung hee the president. His death marked major shifts in the country's regulatory and economic climate, which suddenly put the Daewoo Group on less than steady ground. Even after Park's death, Daewoo continued to hold close political ties, but things changed. Korea's succeeding governments would open up the country's markets to foreign competition, and the cheap loans started to dry up. The 1980s would present new challenges for Daewoo's low-price and low-quality strategy. First, the South Korean won started appreciating, making their exports more expensive compared to goods made in other countries. Compounding this, South Korean labor wages started to rise as Koreans experienced improved living conditions. Suddenly, making and selling cheap goods for the third world wasn't so easy. 
Second, countries started adopting protective trade barriers, looking to favor their own domestic players. And maybe most significantly, China started opening up. Their exporters would adopt some of the same low-cost strategies and compete with companies like Daewoo. The company knew that it needed to adapt to the times in order to survive. The Japanese had already started going upscale. But hey, nothing to worry about, right? Uh, the government's still around, right? In 1988, Daewoo Shipbuilding and Heavy Machinery suffered a near-bankruptcy event. The subsidiary owned the country's second-largest shipyard out in Okpo Bay, Gyoji Island. Years of high debt usage as well as an attitude of revenues over sales led to a turn for the worse. By then, Daewoo carried about $1.8 billion worth of debt in 1988 USD and was facing difficult market conditions. Daewoo turned to the Korean government for a bailout and everyone expected it. Kim and Daewoo argued that they had taken on the shipyard only at Pak Chung Hee's request. He added that the Korea Development Bank had promised to inject 400 billion won of equity, about $1.4 billion in today's dollars, but only provided 200 billion. So the government had an obligation. Even the shipyard employees expected a bailout. Even as the shipyard struggled during the late 1980s, the employees struck for and negotiated wage increases of 25 to 55 percent a year. They knew that the government would either bail them out or find someone else to run the thing. In the end, the government did bail out Daewoo Shipbuilding in 1989, providing 200 billion Korean won of preferential loans and injected another 50 billion won directly into the company. This generous rescue plan reaffirmed Daewoo's closeness to the government even long after Park's assassination. It should have been a come-to-Jesus moment for Kim and his company, and Kim did seem to know that this bailout as well as the changing market conditions, meant that something had to change. More quality, less quantity. In 1990, he announced a company initiative to improve product quality across all of Daewoo's companies, which showed initial successes. For instance, shipbuilding defect rates declined 80%. A few years later, Daewoo announced a plan to hire PhDs to do more advanced product R&D. Unfortunately, a leopard cannot change his spots. In Econ 101, they talk about the danger of moral hazard, where someone does something crazy because they know they don't bear all the consequences if it goes wrong. These initiatives never gained steam as Kim never had his heart in it. Instead, he dived back into what would be his most intoxicating and costly obsession, cars. In 1992, Daewoo Group acquired full control of its motor subsidiary. At this time, the subsidiary was unprofitable, losing $200 million in 1992. Nevertheless, Daewoo Motors embarked on a massive buying spree to become a global automotive leader, likely paid with some of the 1989 bailout money given to Daewoo Shipbuilding. In 1994, Daewoo Motors acquired a technical center in the United Kingdom and started a joint venture in Romania. In 1996, Daewoo spent $1.8 billion to purchase a Polish car company and a truck factory. These made Daewoo the country's second largest automaker after Fiat. They also opened an $800 million car plant in Uzbekistan capable of producing 200,000 cars a year. The idea there would be to produce cars for sale in Russia. After that, they bought a Czech truck manufacturer, entered Ukraine and India through joint ventures, all in all, 14 car factory purchases in 13 countries. Many of these ventures failed, but the company refused to pull out, believing in their growth potential. But they were losing $30 million a year in India. They sold just 423 cars in 1998 in Vietnam. And finally, the cherry on the top, a majority takeover of the troubled Sasang Yong Motor Company in January 1998, the peak of the Asian financial crisis. Who was paying for this? How can they afford to do this? My father always told me, find someone who loves you as much as Daewoo loves debt. All of the Chebo used debt. Their average debt to equity ratio throughout the 1980s and 1990s was 400%. But Daewoo not only carried the most debt, over $11 billion of it, into the 1990s, it was the most structurally vulnerable to debt crises. It isn't the case today 
but long ago the Chebol were structured around a core company. This flagship tends to be the whole group's cash cow, like a Samsung Electronics or something. But Daewoo's core company, Daewoo Corporation, was a trading and financial company that prefers revenues over profits. It still handed out cash to its children, but funded those handouts through borrowings. In my previous video on Hanjing Shipping, I talked about the company's precarious financial state after being severed from its profitable sibling, Korean Air. Without a cash cow, Daewoo also ran on thin ice. The market had long suspected that something was up. In April 1997, on the eve of the Asian financial crisis, Daewoo had the lowest price-to-book ratios of Korea's top chebol, 1.12 compared to Samsung's 6 and Hyundai's 3.66. 1997 triggered a two-year-long series of events that would eventually send Daewoo into insolvency. Late that year, the Korean won plunged in value against the US dollar from 900 won to a high of 1,960 won. Korea had to receive a big, very controversial bailout from various international entities, and the next year the economy shrank nearly 7%. While the other Chebul pulled back, Daewoo plunged ahead recklessly with their classic hustle. They discounted products and acquired new companies just like before. This included the aforementioned purchase of Sasangyong in January 1998, which added even more debt to the company's books. All throughout 1998, despite their already considerable debts, Daewoo managed to raise another $14.1 billion, becoming the nation's single most indebted company. In the third quarter alone, they added another 40% in debt. It is likely that the investors believed that the Korean government would eventually do a bailout, and indeed Daewoo had been in discussions with the government since June 1998. But they went back and forth about what a bailout might look like. The government wanted austerity measures that Daewoo did not want to do. Chairman Kim was an empire builder and could not accept a shrinkage. Late in 1998, the Korean government suddenly realized the financial contagion risk of a Daewoo debt default. They told their financial institutions that they could only hold 5% of their portfolio in Daewoo Group debt, essentially cutting off Daewoo's lines of credit. So long as Daewoo could borrow more money, the company stayed afloat. Kim was confident that the Korean government would ease off on Chebul reform and bail out Daewoo once more. Once that faucet was turned off, things started to get serious. That December, the company finally agreed to downsize, consolidating 51 operating companies into just 10. Daewoo also had to reduce their debt ratio from its 500% over the span of 1999. Late in 1998, the investment bank Nomura Securities published a report titled Alarm Bells Ringing for Daewoo Group, sharing their concerns about Daewoo's debts. However, the market, the banks, and the government were slow to respond to the threat of a Daewoo collapse. The problem with the December 1998 quote-unquote restructuring was that it lacked teeth. Daewoo would be left alone for the entirety of 1999 to do nothing. The creditor banks were supposed to withdraw funding if the company did not hit their quarterly debt reductions, but failed to do this. All the while, rumors floated of big deals that would step in at the last second and save the company. For instance, rumors of Daewoo swapping Daewoo Electronics to acquire Samsung Motors, or of this Saudi prince stepping in, or of a special relationship with the incoming Korean president Kim Dae-jong. These rumors helped everyone delude themselves into believing that Daewoo would stay afloat. But by mid-1999, it became clear to everyone that Daewoo was not meeting its debt reduction marks and was indeed moving towards a default. The credit rating agencies, being timely as always, downgraded Daewoo's debt. The reality was that at the end of 1998, Daewoo was already a bankrupt entity. For the 1998 year, the company reported 25% higher sales and a half trillion Korean won profit loss. Management argued that this loss was due to unique one-off situations relating to Daewoo Telecom. Daewoo Corporation and Daewoo Heavy Industries, the core companies, were generating hundreds of millions of dollars of profit. 
Unfortunately, these profits were generated through a scheme of fictitious overseas asset sales between sister subsidiaries at fake prices. For instance, subsidiary A would sell some asset, like a tractor, to subsidiary B at a crazy price that no one else would pay. B would pay for this with stock or another asset out of its books. After this swap, A gets to record a false profit in a variety of ways. First, directly from the false sale, and second, because A's assets are priced according to the quote-unquote market. They get to also revalue all their other tractors to the new price. Remove these asset swaps and other fraudulent practices, and Daewoo didn't lose half a trillion won, but actually eight times that amount, or four trillion won. Other accounts estimated the amount of fraud going on in both 1997 and 1998 to be as high as 23 trillion won, about $19 billion, Korea's biggest accounting fraud ever up to that point. The scale of the fraud remains up for debate, but regardless, the company was insolvent, a dead man walking with far more liabilities than assets. In July 1999, Kim tried one final gambit. He publicly announced that he would put up all of his personal wealth as collateral and resign all of his positions except for that of Daewoo Motors. He would bring that company to profitability and then retire for good. In return, he wanted creditors to inject another 4 trillion won, or roughly $3.4 billion, into the group. Daewoo would somehow find another $9 billion of collateral to help save the whole company. Not going to lie, it's pretty ballsy for Kim to try staying on after having been responsible for the whole debacle. On August 1999, Kim was removed from his companies and the subsidiaries were placed into bankruptcy, to be sold off in chunks years later. At its end, Daewoo owed over $50 billion in debt to 140 banks in 100 plus countries. Kim fled the country in November 1999 and lived abroad in exile for five years. When he returned, he was placed on trial and received a large fine and a 10-year prison sentence. Less than a year later, he received a presidential pardon. He died in 2019 at the age of 82. Banks and insurance companies lost trillions of won from Daewoo debt. The Korean government had to inject public money to keep those banks from collapsing. It led to extensive reforms in investor transparency and banking oversight. Considering the size of the fraud, the accountants should have sounded the alarms, but they let it slide probably because their clients were so powerful. Several accountants received fines and had their licenses suspended. The Daewoo saga would lead to reforms in the Korean accounting industry. The fraud was extensively documented, but there remains about $750 million to possibly $4 billion missing from the company's coffers. Some of this money might have been used for personal expenses. For instance, a $2.5 million donation to Harvard for Kim's son or was paid to the government as bribes. It's not clear. Today, the Daewoo companies work independently of one another, though they might still bear the name. Few companies have ever grown up as fast as Daewoo, and hopefully few others will implode as spectacularly in the future. Alright everyone, that's it for tonight. Thanks for watching. Subscribe to the channel, uh, sign up for the newsletter, and I'll see you guys next time.